All right, Dave. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the first Field Notes webinar. I'm David Hoover. I'm the director of the National Soil Survey Center, and I have the honor of being your moderator. In my job, I get the opportunity to read all of the technical soil services reports as part of the scientific review process before they are posted to the web. I see great scientific work being done across the country in our offices with innovation and creativity. So the Soil and Plant Science Division leadership decided to hold these webinars to share even more accomplishments in a wide variety of formats through short webinar presentations. We are confident that more people will appreciate this opportunity, step up, and want to share a short 15-minute glimpse into their own science in their own part of the country. I'll go through a few uh, Ah. Well, I thought it was going to. You know, as often as you practice, you still hit the wrong button sometimes. So a few of the uh, uh, specifics. Uh, this is good. These are going to be one way videos uh, and audio feeds. So uh, be sure and if you have questions to submit your questions in the Q&A panel. Uh, the questions will be answered uh, after each presentation. If we have time, we're going to stick to the 15-minute uh, format so we can get all four in within an hour. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted for those of you that, uh, for some folks that can't attend or if you want to go back and review something. Uh, we do have a, uh, a MS uh, team site for the uh, field notes webinars, so we'll have supporting material there. Perhaps some people want to post additional materials to go along with their, their talks. And if you do want uh, closed captioning, uh, turn on the live caption button located at the lower right corner. So if the uh, technical part uh, taken care of, uh, we'll start our agenda for today. Our first presenter is going to be Darren Pinniger of the Chico, California office, and he'll be speaking on MLRA 17 ecological site groups, initial ecological concepts for a highly altered region. Darren? Uh, Darren, unmute yourself, please. Forgive me, uh, thank you. The Preliminary Ecological Site Initiative was a division-wide effort to connect every soil in the continental United States with basic ecological concepts by the end of last year. Earlier this year, Joel Brown, the National Ecological Site Team's leader, asked me and several other people who worked on the PES initiative to share some of their experiences with the Society for Range Management at their annual meeting last month. Uh, I'm now going to share my part of that SRM presentation with you. Let's see, click here. And there's in characteristics. We hear it now. The ecological dynamics of a place in a way that informs and supports conservation efforts. And in some places, this is a harder task than others. MLRI 17 is one of the world's most productive agricultural regions. More than 230 crops are grown there, and on less than 1% of the total farmland in the United States, the Central Valley produces 8% of the nation's agricultural output by value. Worth $43.5 billion in 2013. This concentration of agriculture means that soil mapping over the years has been more detailed in comparison to MLRAs that are predominantly natural land. And it includes 81,411 soil map units that required review and correlation as part of this process. 
the vast majority of them have been altered by urbanization, agriculture, and or hydrologic alteration. I will illustrate the challenges of MLRA 17 with an example that soil scientist Phil Smith, then at the Hanford, California MLRA office, called to my attention. This is the Hogwallow Preserve in Tulare County, California. It is a 10 acre parcel that is owned by the local historical society to preserve the native Mima Mound topography that was historically ubiquitous in the region. The soil survey shows that it is map unit 155, San Joaquin soil, two to 9% slope, the state soil of California. The preserve is its own map unit surrounded by map unit 154, San Joaquin soil, zero to 2% slope, now planted with orange orchards. Prior to the arrival of European annuals, this was likely a vernal pool site. The swales would have collected water during winter storms, had a diverse assortment of native forbs in the spring, and a high percentage of bare earth in the summer and fall. The mounds with their deeper soil probably had native perennial grass year round. These vernal pools are dependent on the durapan in the soils that creates a perched or high water table and unique hydrology that provides habitat for unique species that are specifically adapted to these conditions. Prior to planting orchards in the area, the ground was deep ripped, altering the durapan, though it is still described as part of the soil in the map unit description for 154. The site was then leveled, further altering the hydrology. None of the critical abiotic properties for a vernal pool ecosystem remain in map unit 154. So the question that needed to be addressed was, should the sto soil still be associated with vernal pool ecological sites? Instead of investigating that very difficult question and developing the more refined and detailed ecological sites and its ESDs, a coarser resolution product was developed for the PES process for MLRA 17, an ecological site group. The National Ecological Site Handbook says ESGs are developed for landscape scale management or to describe large complex landscapes. This made them a practical way to achieve the objectives of the PES initiative in the time available and capture the general ecosystem information that may provide useful details for conservation planners. To begin the process, I spent time combing through the existing information that was available on the Valley ecosystems. One of the principal sources I used to formulate ESGs was the Central Valley Historic Mapping Project. This was a 2003 project by the Chico State Geographic Information Center for the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Bureau of Reclamation. It provided some essential information and created a pre-European base map by aggregating a variety of sources into eight terrestrial vegetation communities. The GIC staff was able to provide me a copy of their geodatabase with all their spatial information which became my starting point. I evaluated soils data and other abiotic factors that fell within each of these broad plant communities, which the project had mapped. And I was able to refine some of their concepts for the purpose of the ESG effort. For instance, I was able to split a vernal pool complex from their grasslands and other flat plain habitats based on the presence of a durapan in the soil data. The soil data development toolbox for ArcMap was extremely helpful for evaluating soils data across the entire MLRA, as it produced a raster map of soil properties from the GSERGO data that allowed me to visualize soil information much faster than my initial efforts to export NASA's data and link it with the SERGO map unit polygons. I consider my most successful part of the project to be the splitting of the Central Valley Historic Mapping Project's Alkali Desert Scrub Community. This is a vegetation transect from a 1937 USDA technical bulletin I found, which first indicated that there were landscape plant community relationships that I needed to investigate. With the help of a librarian at the California Department of Water Resources, 
I was able to get a copy of the vegetation map listed as the primary source for this area in the southern part of the MLRA, which made it clear that there were multiple vegetation communities that I needed to learn more about. I reached out to Ryan O'Dell, a BLM soil scientist working in the area, and after discussions with him, he agreed with the idea of creating a basin group dominated by Atriplex spinifera and a fan and terrace group dominated by Atriplex polycarpa. Ryan was even able to provide transects and reference photos for these two groups. Using resources such as NRCS plant guides and terrestrial vegetation of California by Barber, Keeler Wolf, and Schoen Hare, I was able to construct ecological narratives and state and transition models for the seven ESGs I had identified within MLRI 17. These STMs are supported primarily with literature and expert knowledge and describe the general ecological dynamics and community pathways of the primary concept of each ESG. However, they gloss over finer detailed dynamics in soil and site conditions, and they're lacking or limited in their representation of non-reference states, transitions, and restoration pathways, which are given in extremely general terms. Given the challenges of MLRA 17 and the time and labor constraints of the PES initiative, these ecological site groups represent a reasonable outcome that provide good baseline conditions to test and refine. Through future work, they'll be prioritized by the needs within the state. That being said, they are not fully fleshed out concepts, they were not field verified, and lack the supporting data that would typically be found in an ecological site description being used to support conservation efforts on the ground. For that product to be developed, soil survey update work will be necessary so that a complete and accurate description of current soil conditions are available, and time and resources will need to be spent evaluating the effects of restoration and conservation practices in this highly altered region. It is my sincere hope that I can be part of the effort to produce a more complete and refined version of these products in the not too distant future. Thank you so much for your time. Here is my contact information if you have questions or would like more information on my process. Uh, thanks, Darren. Our next presenter is Kenneth Hall from the Rosenberg, Texas office and he'll be presenting on a digital soil survey mapping approach to a coastal zone soil survey of West Galveston Bay. So, Kenneth, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Let's see if I can get this loaded. Okay, y'all seeing this? Looks great. Okay, appreciate it. So uh, as was mentioned, uh, my name is Kenny Hall. I am out of the Rosenberg Soil Survey Office, and I'm going to be discussing a digital soil survey mapping approach that we've adopted for a coastal zone soil survey of West Galveston Bay. Currently, coastal zone soil surveys are being used for habitat restoration projects such as seagrass and oyster restoration, uh, shoreline erosion control projects, as well as for dredge material. The majority of the coastal zone soil survey projects are located along the East Coast, but there are a few located along the Gulf of Mexico. So when we began our approach, we kind of knew that some things would need to be considered with the boat that we received. As predicted, weather would be our main limiting factor at the time of for operation. As cold fronts blew through, this would push out much of the water in the bays and tidal areas that we, we were needing to access. And when this happens, many of our access boat ramps and shallow water sample sites really become inaccessible. And if this weren't enough, strong winds from any direction make operating the vibracore that we get our cores with unsafe to use. 
because of these varying conditions, it is vital to have a close watch on our weather. You know, weather predictions, our tide charts that we have access to, and knowing that a backup plan may very well be necessary. If this weren't enough, pretty soon COVID became a major limiting factor on the amount of time we could access the boat as well. When we started out, uh, our only navigation aids that we relied on for determining core locations included the bathymetry that we had on hand and the use of satellite imagery as seen on a smartphone. Now, when we did get the, the boat, it came with some uh, onboard navigation with navigational charts, and that did give us some useful information as well. But really, uh, some of the areas such as San Luis Pass require a lot of awareness when operating a boat. Oftentimes, you know, you can be cruising in, in six meter depth of water and all of a sudden find yourself stuck on a sandbar. So we knew uh, some, some careful planning would need to take place. Here are some photos of the cores that we gathered this past March. These are mostly sandy throughout, but a few have loamy layers lower in the profile. There is some evidence of storm events by the distribution of sands and, and organic matter present. Some key observations on subaqueous soils that differ from terrestrial include smell tests, as well as 3% and 30% hydrogen peroxide tests for sulfide compounds. The presence of reduced monosulfide material is indicated by a color change of the soil immediately when 3% hydrogen peroxide is added. This is also indicated when there is a strong odor of hydrogen sulfide present. The presence of, sul of the sulfide material pyrite is indicated by an effervescence in the soil when 30% hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide is added. These are important indicators because if and when these soils are exposed to oxygen, potentially over time, the sulfides will oxidize, the pH will drop significantly, and acid sulfate will form which renders the soil inhabitable by vegetation. And this is especially relevant with dredge material that's used for other projects. Some of the other subaqueous soil observations include describing colors rapidly when exposed to air because reduced grays, blues, and even green colors would rapidly turn into brown or yellow. We, we describe shell fragments, uh, the size and amounts that we see, and also whether the soil is fluid versus non-fluid. And we believe many of the sites close to shore in our marsh areas have a very fluid surface that is not well captured by using a vibracore, but most likely better captured with a Macaulay auger or similar. These grass areas are subaqueous, but the boat was unable to get to these sites uh, for, to use the vibracore. We pounded a core into the soil and extracted by hand together samples. And while this technically worked, it was quite slow and very difficult. Here's some cores uh, taken in subaqueous areas closer to the mainland that had more clay than those that were found around the barrier island. This was expected due to the reasons for the formation of the barrier island versus the mainland. So when it came to our sampling design, I do need to give credit to Alex Stum, our GIS specialist, for the brains behind our approach. And some of the issues that we had to overcome some that I mentioned before, you know, water, uh, that was a whole new ball game for us. We uh, found that we would have to deal with suspended sediment in the water column. And when we began, we were really unaware for the most part of the landforms that would be present. And there were very few visual indicators other than the shorelines. And as I mentioned before, our boat time is limited due to, due to weather conditions and now this past year due to COVID. Time consumption was also a big one. A good day would really just produce four soil cores. 
So we needed a design that would help us obtain the best representative samples for the variability that exists in our landscape. This led us to choose the uh, condition Latin hypercube for our sampling design. And CLHS is a near random but data driven sampling design that tries to sample features that represent the distribution of the variability across the landscape rather than just seeking a purely random sample. And the more the more samples that you have, the closer to reality that you are. And the CLHS distributes probable intervals across each covariate. Intervals are narrower where there is a higher density of pixels. But it's only as good as the covariates that you have chosen to represent the landscape that we're working on. Getting covariates for the coastal zone has proved to be a challenge. Uh, we lack much relief. You know, there's few visible indicators, and this brings some difficulty. Some covariates that we have attempted include relative position, such as distance from the shoreline, imagery such as LIDAR and sonar, elevation data such as water bathymetry, and the bathymetry looks a lot like topography for those who aren't familiar with it, but instead of containing lines that connect points of equal elevation, it contains lines that connect connects points of equal water depth. Some LIDAR considerations. Light as it moves through the water column poses some challenges. We have to deal with refraction. There's waves present. The turbidity of the water and varying tides, these factors all create limitations on LIDAR. And so another option uh, would be to use updated topobathymetry, which has a shorter wavelength with near infrared and might hopefully penetrate the water column with these challenges. Distance from various objects was a covariate that we thought could be quite useful. Ingress would be those rivers, bayous, and creeks that dump sediment into our base system. Egress would be the passes that open the bay system to the Gulf. These are significant because movement of sediment and water can cause geomorphic features. And we believe this significance would be good to include in our sampling method, but it actually proved to produce mostly outliers rather than points within representative areas. This distribution focused better on representative areas and we kept this one. It is important because of the different parent material. The mainland side of the bay tends to be clayier, whereas the barrier side is sandy. And this comes into play with map unit design. Some relative intensities for mapping. Our tidal areas are quite diverse. This makes up the areas from 0 to 0.58 meters of water depth, and that was identified using LIDAR. This depth matches the tide charts, and I should note, though, uh, kind of mentioned earlier that tropical storms and even cold fronts can change the depth of water over these areas. Uh, the second, uh, shallow areas, and these contain geomorphic features, mostly from riptides, wave action, and fan overwashing. This area includes water depths of 0.58 to 1.5 meters. These areas will have some vegetation, but not as much ecology as the tidal areas mentioned previously. And the third, uh, deep waters. Deep areas were those beyond uh, one and a half meters water depth and really no plants to speak of as light doesn't penetrate well beyond two meter water depth in West Galveston Bay. CLHS is most appropriate for obscure landscapes and it seems to fit our coastal zone soil survey project well. It gives us the ability to stratify by different intensities of mapping, but as mentioned previously, our covariate selection is most critical. 
This is the display of our CLHS points. There's 100 of them total. We have 30 tidal, 45 shallow, and 25 deep. Some of the challenges we face, a big one, limitations to vibro coring access. Our boat drafts pretty much a two foot depth and can't go into our shallow areas that are a foot or less deep to get that vibro core. So really in these areas, we have to walk through marsh to get to them and this proves to be quite difficult. You know, some discrepancies that we've seen, you know, sometimes what the CLHS point says it should be and what it actually is can be a little bit different. Uh, shallow points, not necessarily located in shallow areas, but maybe we can see those shallow areas approximately 50 yards away. So what are we seeing here? Is it a bad GPS signal, photo interpretation error, satellite Im imagery problems? One thing we do know is the bathymetry that we have on hand is fairly coarse and not very precise. So moving forward, we're going to continue to acquire as many points as possible. After sampling, we will uh, correlate our observations, refine covariates, and run predictive models. We'll evaluate the model uncertainty and possibly refine model parameters and left to be determined, either validate the model with split sample or conduct a smaller field campaign to gather more observations to independently validate model output. So that is all I have for the moment. Um, if anybody has suggestions on some uh, really good covariates or better ways of doing this. Um, we are all open ears and uh, willing to try things out because we are still uh, fairly in the beginning stages of this. And uh, if you have any questions and want to uh, put those in the chat or send me an email, I'd be happy to answer what I can. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you, Kenneth. We, we don't, don't have time have questions. questions. There, there were two, two in the, in the chat. chat, but you could either you answer, answer in the chat or, or answer, answer later, later and we'll be sure to include that. that things are posted. Are posted. Sounds good. Our next, Our presenter, next presenter is Sarah Russell from the Gilmer, Texas office. She'll be talking about using our studio for enhanced digital soil mapping. Sarah? Okay, hi everybody. Um, I hope that the presentation is working well and that I'm everyone's able to hear me and see my slides. If not, please let me know before I keep uh, rambling on. You're um, good on both. I'm sorry, what? You're good on both. Okay, good. For well, for now anyway, we'll see. Uh, using digital means to create soil maps has, in recent years, become a focus of the soil science community. Trying to improve the accuracy of our products has always been a goal within NRCS Soil Survey. One way to achieve this has been to stay abreast with current technological developments so that we may be or that they may be implemented in our practices. Nacogdoches lies within MLRA 1. 33B, also known as the Piney Woods Soil Survey Area, most of which resides within East Texas. After setting a goal to start a digital mapping project to see how feasible it would be to use such methods, the Nacogdoches Soil Survey Office selected an area of focus. The Jasper Newton County Soil Survey was chosen for various reasons as the focus, one being that an update of this soil survey has been requested by local NRCS offices and producers. Uh, another reason being that the survey is one of the remaining order three surveys that needs to be updated to order two. And also the southern portion of this survey lies in MLRA 152, which is already updated. So a join would be ideal. And last but not least, most soils in Jasper and Newton counties are really large associations and complexes that need to be reassessed for accuracy. 
One of the first steps was to analyze the existing soil series in Jasper and Newton counties. As mentioned before, most of them were large associations and complexes that needed to be split out. These criteria were closely examined and differences noted that may be useful in separating one series from another. Taxonomy, series extent, geology, parent material, landform and landscape were all extremely useful. Some of the soils mapped in the same complex or association actually had the same taxonomies and even landform and or landscape positioning. A few of the soils were mapped broadly in other surveys several states away, but only mapped in MLRA 133B in Jasper and Newton and nowhere else nearby. Cases such as these were often than not the normal for this particular survey, so thorough research and comparison was necessary for the culling process. Pictured are several of the geographical tools useful for this process. Obviously, block diagrams were helpful for landscape and landform separation. The bottom left of the slide is an example of soil profiles built using a tool of Dylan Bodets from GitHub. Next to the profiles is a picture of the taxonomy umbrella that was built by Tyson Hart. Each soil was broken down into wide taxonomic classification and compared against each other for assessment. Soils that were too similar to each other and needed to be culled down became much more apparent. Research also found that a few of the series were created solely for Jasper and Newton counties and were comprised of less than a total of 1,500 acres, despite being so similar to a sister soil that they were basically the same. It was issues like these that needed to be addressed by this project. It was decided to use the adjoining county, Tyler County, as a basis for comparison for the model. Tyler County was a more recent survey that had similar soils and geologies. 16 covariate rasters for Tyler were created using ArcGIS, ArcSIE, and Saga. Box plots for Tyler County were created, some of which were uh, not very useful. Profile, for example, was not as helpful as all the series analyzed looked too similar to differentiate from each other with much discernible confidence. Plan form proved to be another one of the 16 covariates that didn't yield the similar box plot data. An example of useful covariate data was slope height. The box plot for slope height was a better tool than the box plot for profile as it yielded more variation amongst the series. Once Tyler County soils were assessed, 12 were chosen that would hopefully represent the soils seen in the adjoining Jasper and Newton counties. It was decided to use geology as a jumping off point since the Catahoula geology extended from Tyler into northern and Jasper and Newton counties, covering approximately 100,000 acres therein. This made it easier to narrow down and focus on a smaller and easier to manage subset of data. The 16 covariates that were created initially were culled down to eight. These eight were selected because they displayed the greatest variability from one another. Catch slope, normal height, slope, slope height, NDVI or normalized difference vegetation index, saga wetness, standard height and valley depth. Statistics from the box plots for Tyler County were used to form ranges for the 12 Jasper Newton soils that were chosen for the Catahoula geology. Each soil needed specific values to be developed for each respective covariate, including uh, min, first quartile, median, third quartile, and max. Pictured is data for the slope covariate for each of the 12 soils. Using this made it easier to break out the slope values. Once the statistics were determined, it was time to plug them into ArcSIE and RStudio, respectively. ArcSIE was not as efficient for the study as it crashed during the runtime. There's undoubtedly some trial and error that would help in determining the causes of the ArcSIE crashes with the specific data, um, possibly due to machine error or user error. But for time's sake, RStudio was used as it processed the information in approximately one minute. All the covariates were stacked and each map unit was given a range. Slope, for example, was assigned a value of 1% for the min, 2% for the first quartile, 3% for the median, 
4% for the third quartile and 5% for the max value. Each five meter pixel has a probability from zero to 100% of having enough parallel variables towards that specific map unit as it's analyzed. This is the final product. Uh, the map units were stacked and each pixel's probability is compared. The result is a five meter soils map that shows the highest probable map unit and confidence value. In this depiction, the old soil lines are shown overlying the new computer generated map. And at first glance, it looks promising. This is the final product as a standalone without the old line overlay. Ground truthing is currently being carried out to evaluate uh, digital soil mapping methodologies and accuracy. At this time, the newly digitally regener or generated map is yielding promising accuracy, although there are definitely areas where the model is not correct and needs to be tweaked. Some of the polygons delineated by the model are off due to the wrong series being selected as a representative for the specific areas. And in some places, the ranges derived need to be assessed and reset. A large portion of the map is pretty spot on, especially where slope, landform, landscape, and wetness are predicted. Pedons are being collected and entered into NASAs, and old mapping units are also compared against the new map and the ground truthing results. It does bear stating that retired soil scientists from this area who had uh, mapped there before all did exemplary work in their pedon collection, and their data was heavily leaned on during this developmental process. All of the pedons that are gathered currently by the Nacogdoches Soil Survey Office are completed by sampling them where access is available. At this time, using sampling means generated by Condition Latin Hypercube are impractical for this area. Um, obtaining permissions is exceedingly difficult and not easily granted. Many of the landowners are small scale and finding even the means of contact is sometimes impossible. But thankfully, there are national forests, uh, parks, and a few private landowners that make access available and grant opportunities for us to gather data. And the data will, of course, be adjusted to reflect the results seen in the field and statistics will be rerun and a new map regenerated. Uh, hopefully with trial and error, we will become more efficient at using DSM means for soil survey work. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I'm not seeing any questions in the in the Q&A, but I'll ask a question. Well, OK, it sounds like you're certainly sold on on these methods and the and the final products. Uh, how are your users of the product uh, reacting to it? Is it meeting their needs also? Well, um, the answer is very simple and it's uh, there are no users yet. We are still uh, tweaking the methodologies that we're using and we're still working on our final product, but hopefully we are going to get some feedback on that pretty soon. Yeah, we'd love to hear how, the, how that comes out. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share. All right, still no uh, questions, so we'll move on. Thank you again. Before I introduce the last speaker, I do want to point out that the next webinar that we're going to have, the next Field Notes webinar, is going to be on April 13th. Save the date, tell your friends. Our last presenter today is going to be Jacob Islib from the Tallinn, Connecticut office, who is going to be talking on virtual education and outreach strategies from NRCS, Connecticut. Jacob. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jacob Islib. I'm the resource soil scientist with USDA NRCS Connecticut. And I've been with NRCS about 14 years, um, mostly working in offices focused on initial and update soil survey. I'm now primarily focused on providing technical soil services to internal staff and external USDA customers within the state of Connecticut.
The school staff at NRCS Connecticut has for many years had an active annual program of in-person education and outreach events. Besides Envirothon and FFA land judging competitions, we help provide a student summer camp program at UConn, training workshops for state and local agencies, and provide a number of guest presentations and field tours. Almost exactly a year ago, Connecticut was caught geographically right between the COVID inf infection hotspots in the New York City metro and Boston metro areas. Stay at home orders were implemented here early on. As the pandemic was on the rise during mid-March and extending through mid-April, most meetings and conferences were canceled. With all the shock and uncertainty of our collective situation, schedules were cleared for a short while. Our first, our first attempt to move to a virtual format was an annual Envirothon competition. The steering committee felt that by that point in the year, the students had done so much preparation that we would be remiss not to provide an, uh, an event to cap the Envirothon program that school year. Connecticut ended up being one of nine states that adapted its competition to a virtual format for 2020. In our case, the, using the Google Classrooms platform, with our test being a Google Forms quiz, we were able to incorporate photos of a soil profile, screenshots, and a PDF of a soil survey custom report and other digital representations of a field site we typically use for the outdoor competition. Our typical Envirothon soils exam is completely multiple choice, so adapting that to an online exam was straightforward. The Envirothon event ended up going well. Feedback indicated the students and advisors appreciated our effort to hold the Envirothon in some fashion. Team scores had a normal distribution and we had no technical snafus. We benefited from the event and that it boosted our confidence in being able to continue to hold some of our annual events in a virtual format. <clears throat> for nearly a decade, the University of Connecticut has held a week long field experience for high school students where they get to stay in college dorms and eat in the dining halls while spending their days engaged in outdoor activities relating to different natural resources disciplines like forestry, water quality and hydrology, wildlife and soil science. They call this program the Natural Resource Conservation Academy or NRCA and it's held every year in July. NRCS Connecticut soil staff lead the soil activities for NRCA. The lead organizers for NRCA at UConn decided to attempt to hold the event virtually in July of 2020. This event presented much greater challenge to port to a virtual event as it is a week long and more of an in-depth field experience than a day long competition like Envirothon or FFA. So how do we provide a virtual field experience was the question of the moment. The short answer is that you really can't exactly replace a field experience with something that has a participant sitting behind a computer, but how close can you approximate it and leave students feeling like they haven't just wasted a week of their summer vacation on Zoom? There were a number of meetings discussing virtual strategies, and I think many were fighting skepticism about the whole idea. At one of the meetings, a geology professor showed a field tour story map his graduate, his graduate students had developed that included a lot of video footage at the field stops. As a temporary replacement for our Sewell's field tour, this seemed like a format that could work. So I know there's been some great story map uh, information provided recently, so I'll focus on video production for a minute. I need to mention that I'm not a video production expert, but I've found myself creating and using video a lot this year with all the virtual events. It can be a great teaching tool, and I expect that video outreach and training will persist even as in-person events pick back up again. When we set out to make the NRCA story map, we needed to create a bunch of videos covering to topics that we would normally present in the field. There's a lot of great general soil science videos out there, including ones made by NSSC on their YouTube channel. It's definitely worth looking at what's on there if you find yourself needing some general content for a similar project. We wanted to create videos that focused on our local soils and landscapes to give our story map a regional focus. We had a Pathways intern in the Tallinn, Connecticut Soil Survey offices, office last summer, so armed with a tech-savvy millennial, we went out to shoot some videos in a Wisconsin and uh, glacial lake bed and surrounding glacial fluvial deltas and terraces. That first day, we just brought our iPhones along with our regular field tours. 
My first video is shown in the screenshot at the top right. Intern Garrett, intern Garrett corrected me when I finished shooting the video. I was holding my phone in the portrait orientation, and you can see the resulting black empty space on either side of that video. Lesson learned, all future videos were shot in landscape orientation, which is shown as an, in the next screenshot down. We later borrowed a GoPro from Christy Wiley in Amherst, which makes excellent quality video footage. However, we found that with a GoPro, an extra, I'm, I'm sorry, with, with the GoPro that without an external microphone and windscreen, the auto, audio had a lot of ambient noise. It did come with a stabilizer, which we used and really liked. We ended up mostly shooting video using the iPhone and later bought a stabilizer with an iPhone mount. For video editing, I had no clue what to use and talked to Garrett. The software he was familiar with was not in the CC cert certification software list. So after some more digging, we found that Shotcut, which is a common open source video editing software, was CCE certified, so we went with that. NRCS public affairs specialists and some others may have licenses for more robust editing software like Adobe Creative Suite. If you have any staff with this advanced software that are enthusiastic about helping with videos, by all means, partner with them. As far as operating Shotcut, it's pretty intuitive software. You can import and drag and drop video files into the player or playlist from a file directory, and then videos can be added to a timeline. The timeline interface will be uh, familiar to anybody who does you know, home recording or similar video audio edit editing. Once in the timeline, video can be clipped, moved around, split, etc. You can add fade ins, fade outs. There's some decent audio filters that can add noise suppression and compression. It's certainly not as robust as uh, the licensed software, but you can make good videos with Shotcut. And finally, you export all the content you build in the timeline to a single video file. And many different options are available to dial in whatever format and settings you want. And your final video can then be uploaded to a streaming service like YouTube for sharing or used directly in a share or on a virtual meeting platform. Our final source program for NRCA was as follows. Debbie Surabian and I scripted a screen share presentation on soil properties and soil formation, and we had video content showing related soil properties or concepts in the field. We would break from our lecture every five to 10 minutes and show a video from a new location embedded in the story map. It was kind of like having a correspondent in the field, and we were able to include a variety of staff that way, including Connecticut, uh, Tallinn, Connecticut soil survey staff, the lab director at the Yukon plant, uh, soil plant nutrient analysis lab, and even some existing content like a soil color video featuring Meredith Albers. The story map framework was an effective replacement for the field tour, as the students could see where the video was shot and get some geographic variety around the state. While mixing live video, screen share presentations, and map com content helps to keep a virtual event from being stale, I highly recommend trying to incorporate hands-on activities, if at all possible. For NRCA, we included a live soil texturing activity. It required a lot of prep as far as collecting multiple sample materials, bagging and mailing them to students, but we, re we received positive feedback specifically about that activity. These texture kits also included some independent hands-on activities, like make your own soil profile instructions, career outreach materials, and some NRCS swag and stickers. Okay, here's some lessons learned related to creating video content. Coordinate your video content with public affairs specialists and or editors. This will be a different process for SPSD staff and state level NRCS staff, but follow the process provided to you by them. Practice good data management with your video files and shot cut projects and plan to do some additional editing based on review feedback. As part of that coordination, make sure to include proper EEO non-discrimination statements where recommended. In videos or, or recorded presentations, we need to be especially vigilant about image use licensing. We're often working solo and while it's possible, adding the task of making video while you're working alone is tedious. I recommend looking for times where you may have additional staff in, in hand, on hand and ask someone to shoot some video using their phone. Two to eight minute short videos can be a great way to provide cross training to coworkers or customers. Video production isn't just for long format presentations. The use of tripods and stabilizers really improve the quality of the video, avoiding shaky footage 
that can be distracting for the viewer and comes across as low quality. And lastly, leave yourself plenty of time if you plan to produce video content. I realized early on that time spent scripting out what I wanted to say on video saved a lot of editing time. If you just wing it and plan to edit later, brace yourself for a lot of editing. So before I close to take any questions, I do want to ask that if anybody knows of better software we can use on our work computers or improve workflows from what I outlined today, please let me know or better yet request to provide a field notes webinar. This method is certainly just one of many and I'm sure others would like to see different strategies for providing virtual training and outreach. I thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. We'll give uh, people a little bit of time, uh, maybe about a minute to get some questions in. Uh, I do want to uh, point out that uh, all of this will be recorded. It's on the, um, the MS Teams site. This is also a site that stays live as a, as, a, as a team. So questions that you have and comments that you want to make as you come up with them uh, in the coming days uh, will certainly be uh, posted there. So that's enough awkward silence. I, I, I don't see uh, any questions coming in. So I will just give a final reminder that our next uh, Field Notes webinar will be on April 13th. Uh, each one of the uh, SPSD regions as well as the center have uh, official contacts, uh, a review team that's reviewing the presentations, uh, recommending which ones will be uh, uh, done for, the, for each month. Uh, so their other job is to go out and uh, solicit and encourage uh, their co-workers in their respective areas. So this is a, an opportunity again for you to step forward and and show what you're doing. Uh, make your own short presentation. So thank you for your attendance, for your questions and your interest. See you next month.